Hey, what's up, everybody? It's your girl, Dr. Rhonda M. Lawson, and I am back. I did y'all hope y'all didn't miss me too much? I know I missed last week, and y'all, y'all probably like, oh, Rhonda is getting real undependable, but you know, Rhonda has family stuff going on, so sometimes I have to step back from the podcast so I can take care of family. So, um, my lovely guest who I have on tonight was very sweet and decided that, you know, she would wait another week or so so we could do her interview because I had family visiting me. And then last week, my daughter was in the National American Miss Maryland pageant and she got fourth runner up. Yay! I'm so happy for her. <laughs> and Dr. Candicia, she is a soror as well. So shouts out to the Zetas just doing wonderful things in this world. Um, so, <laughs> yes, yes. So tonight I'm going to introduce you to another lovely lady of the dove, Miss Dr. Candicia Randolph, my soror, and I'm so happy to have her on. Um, I've been watching her journey for a long time. I remember when she was um, going through her doctoral program. I remember when she announced that she would be writing a book. So I'm very, very proud and happy to have her on my show. So Dr. Candicia, thank you so much for joining me tonight. And thank you once again for your patience when my family was visiting me. Not a problem whatsoever as the young people. And I know I've gotten old because I say as the young people now. <laughs> <laughs> like to say life is going to life and life yes. is life. Um, or as I like to say, adulting sucks. <laughs> and so... <laughs> I, I totally understand something happening one day. I looked up one day. I said, is it Wednesday? Oh, no, it's Friday. Okay, I'm confused. So <laughs> not not a problem. When it comes to family and when it comes to, I was explaining this to a sorrow's daughter earlier today, and she was asking me about a recent decision she made. And I said, well, you made a calculated decision for a young person. And yeah. I applaud you. I said, but what I know now about life, I would have made a different decision. I said, but that's because I've lived some more life, right? Um, so, you know, I'm all about now being there for other people, but you have to balance it with not self-preservation, but self-intentionality. I'm not going to say self-care because I really feel like that's a trending word. And, you know, in a it, few it years- is. It's starting to become trending. But yeah. I, but, I mean, it's, it's real because we do oh. need to care about ourselves. But you're right. It's starting to become trending. And um, I wonder sometimes if it's going to lose its value. Exactly. And that's that's the reason why I said it's trending, because I feel like in a few years we will have replaced it with something else in the actual sentiments behind what self-care is supposed to be. That's why I said self-intentionality, because not just being not just caring for yourself. You know, I see a lot of people saying, oh, I'm getting a pedicure self-care. Well, that's great. But like in my world, that's maintenance. <laughs> so I, w I want us to, you know, take it a step beyond. So, no, finding that balance in life where you're doing what you need to do to get ahead, but you're doing what you need to do to be sane. Yes. I'm here for that every day. Amen to that. Amen to that. So, first of all, I want to say that just what you said comes across as a true leader. And um, that is really what your book is about, um, leadership. So can you tell us a bit about the book? And do you have a, a, the book with you so you can show us the cover? I do have it with me. So I keep, this is my copy. So you guys can see that's what the hard copy looks like. There are two versions, both the hard copy and the soft copy. Any I'll let you go on, they should both be the same price. Mm -hmm. uh, the paperback is $24.95 and the hardback is $38.95 available on Amazon and Barnes, of no Barnes and Noble, of course. Mm -hmm. But Target has also picked it up along with other retailers. Wonderful. Uh, Thrift books, Penguin books. I even saw it on a Spanish website. Somebody mm -hmm. bought two copies and was selling it on eBay. And I said, okay, that's fine. You Come purchased on. it. So Come I got on, money. international. <laughs> right. I was like, I don't know what this says, but it's my name for real. And there's the copywritten image. So it's me, right? I don't yes. know what their website said, though, Lord. But yes, you are absolutely <laughs> correct. The book is about leadership. And I tell people, uh, I know when I was going through the publication process, originally they had the second half of the book as a subtitle, which is Leadership, Dispensation, and Challenges. And I said, mm -hmm. no, the whole title of the book is the title. There is no subtitle because you have to look at both sections. And I've had a lot of people ask me, well, it's about the Black church. Can I read it if I'm white? Uh, Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, can yeah. I read it if that's oh, a real question. No, I was just going to say that's a real question. I've noticed often 
that uh, when non-Black people maybe take an interest in something that seems like it's not for them or only for Black people, they feel like they have to ask permission um, to read it. Like they won't be able to get something out of it. Like the audience is only going to be for one group. And that's what I told. And yeah, somebody did exactly that on my Facebook authors page, which is at Dr. Space Condicia Randolph. You know, she she questioned, oh, I'm white. Can I read it? Can I take part in the conversation? Absolutely. You know, the information that's in the book is cross-culturally applicable. It is applicable to both faith-based organizations, other nonprofits, civic for-profits. Um, but I really think that the nonprofit sector, both faith-based and non-faith-based, will probably find the most value in it because I have learned that those sectors of society, because of money issues a lot of times, don't have access to the same resources. Now, when we kind of begin to see that delineation that you're speaking of between, we'll just say black and white. Mm -hmm. In black nonprofits and in black faith-based spaces, we don't have the same access to the type of information that's in the book as easily as a white church might, because typically how they're established, you, you, you're you going to have someone in the white church who is a third, fourth, fifth generation college student, um, might be a C-suite executive, whereas in the black church, it's not that we don't have C-suite executives, but we also know right. we still have a lot of first gen kids. Right. And so that means that their grandparents and their parents didn't go to school and a lot of the operations. And that's one big thing about the book. It's about leadership, but it's also organizational development. So it's, it's really uh, a two hitter, so to speak. You have the leadership aspect, but then you have to understand that once you go beyond the process of what leadership is and developing that pipeline of leadership, it doesn't really matter how great of a leader someone is if there's not a stable organization for them to lead. And so looking at things like finances and the true importance of knowledge, skills, abilities, and competencies when it comes to leadership within, again, the Black church, but also other faith-based organizations, other nonprofit organizations. And sometimes with nonprofits, um, we fall into that trap, potentially working with a, a client that I have coming up. Part of the issue is the people who sat on their boards previously have just been people who've been points of connection and not really committed or concerned. Um, and so one of the things the president was saying was he wanted people who were committed and who were capable as opposed to these points of connections. And that's, we, we talk about all of that in the book. Um, it is a long read. <laughs> one person said to me, well, daughter, you wrote. And when you got tired, you wrote, and then you wrote some more. I said, I did. And then when I got real tired, I wrote one more time. Um, so it's a lot. And I don't tell people like one person was like, well, I may not get through it all right away. I was like, it's okay. Read a chapter right. at a time. Read half yeah, a yeah. chapter at a time. Some some things are going to be more dense than others. And just by virtue of what the manuscript came out of, some of it you might have to read two or three times. Um, I'm a leadership subject matter expert. I specialize in organizational development. And I have a specific interest in how culture and race mitigate the leadership process. And so for me, we're talking about things that I was trained to do. I, I got 500 books into the left of me on my fireplace hearth from school. And so for me, it's second nature. But if it's information that we're new to, take your time to read it. And it doesn't mean that you are less educated, but you might be a subject matter expert in microbiology. If I'm going to read a microbiology book, I need to take my time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I would have to take my time too on some on uh, microbiology. <laughs> Listen, my time and time and time again. <laughs> well, now, um, what is it that what is what is that one overlying message that you want people to take away from the book? One message that I want people to take away from the book. Mm, there are lots of messages, but we'll say that the undercurrent or what the uh, original frame of mind was when I started out on the research was understanding the connectivity between leadership in the Black church and then the impact that it has on a broader societal context. And that goes just outside of Black spaces, you know, obviously, or it's implied that it's Black spaces, but it goes further than that and it's deeper than that. And so looking at, and the reason behind that is because 
one, if you look at the cultural nuances or definitions of Blacks in America, part of that identity, uh, what do I want to call it, identity definition is rooted in the church just because of the cultural impact it has. Now, that doesn't mean the church should define your life. It doesn't mean that if you're members of another faith or go to a church that's not a predominantly Black church, that you're not equally as Black. Not what we're saying at all. But if you study the history of Blacks and the Black diaspora in America, mm -hmm. you see that the Black church was central to what that collective identity looks like. And by virtue of that position in Black America, and not Black just being Black Americans, but Black from all, aspira, all members of the African diaspora that find themselves in America, it, it has a huge influence factor and impact. And so it's larger than just the PTA at school, or it's larger than just and there are other organizations that have wonderful impacts globally. Um, Boys and Girls Club, you know, um, Girl Scouts, Boy Scouts, they have huge impact factors. But when you look at Blacks in America and look at the DNA that's there, there's no single greater institution conglomerate that actually impacts our people from the way we started education. A lot of the HBCUs were started at churches. Um, the Black church was the foundation for our first businesses, insurance companies, banks. And so because of that, people look to the church, not just for what people say is leadership, meaning they're looking for, you know, direction in the community, so to speak. But the way they define leadership and how they carry it out, a lot of people look at the church or, you know, people, again, in their other faith-based situations as a moniker. And what I began to see was that behaviors that I saw in church meetings and I saw at church, I saw them in other organizations. Mm. And I'm like, okay, well, where did the behaviors come from? What preceded what? And by virtue of chronology, the church predates all of those organizations. There was no black, there's no black organization in America that's older than the black church. And so these defunct leadership behaviors that I saw, the gaps, the deficiencies. I saw them in the Black church and in the church that I held membership in. And so what I really want people to understand is that it's not about criticism. And I, and I say this in the book. This book is not a condemnation on the Black church. And it is not a book that is to cast some irrevocable judgment. It is to, hot, it's to one, provide a critical analysis based on members' experiences who are members of the Black church, as well as theoretical concepts, but then also to provide some practical recommendations for the gaps that are seen. Because we are that important, and I use the word we because I'm a member of the Black church conglomerate. So because we are that important, not only do we have to recognize what those gaps are, but we have to take accountability. Um, I use the statistic when I talk about the book all the time because it sticks out in my head. At any given time, T.D. Jakes, the research shows, not my opinion, but the actual research shows, the T.D. Jakes has access to 10 million people at any given time on any given day. And, you know, some people may say, oh, well, you know, the Potter's House isn't a black church. But that's arguable. It might be multicultural, but it is very much led by a Black man from West Virginia who's rooted in Black theology and Black church doctrine. Doesn't mean mm -hmm. he might not lead differently, but he is rooted in those things. And they're talked about in the church and they're talked about during his sermons because I watch the Potter's House all the time, right? So then if we know that this group of people, mainly pastors, carries that type of influence, not just on people's individual lives, but how individual lives, excuse me, but how they run their businesses, how they show up as leaders in other organizations. So now we're talking about people's businesses, people's home lives, people who decide to become members of fraternities, sororities, the NAACP, the SCLC, the NCNW, 100 Black Men, Coalition of 100 Black Women. Somebody in those groups, in some leadership rank, at some point in their life, the statistics show, have been a member of the Black church. Absolutely. And so it's just, it is critical and it's imperative 
that we as a culture, as a being, as a society, truly understand, A, the true holistic process of leadership, what it is and isn't, but then those org development things, communication, um, collaboration, knowledge, skills, and abilities. You know, one thing that the participants of my research said when it, in the collaboration chapter was, do you see churches collaborating together? And I got answers, everything that varied from, nope, not at all, to we collaborate at like state congresses or state conference or the <laughs> annual meeting. And I'm like, okay, that's not collaboration. That's attending a meeting, but no problem. I got it. <laughs> and then other people, the only answer was we collaborate from marches and rallies or political stuff, but nothing else. So that means it's, it's an understanding of not know of um, not knowing what collaboration is. All of that. So all of these things are, you know, when you say, what's one thing? I want us to know it all. Now, I don't want us to be experts in it all, right? That's why I'm here. Hire, you know, bring me in as a consultant and we'll talk about the, the intricacies, but understand that what happens within those metaphorical four walls does not stay within those four walls. And we have right. to accept responsibility for how it shapes the broader societal uh, culture. Um, there are some some research specialists, and I hinted on this, I don't remember what chapter it is, but they talk about how the civil rights movement, which was fueled by housed, well, we'll put it this way, it was housed at the church. It was fueled by several different things. You know, I'm not gonna give credit to all of civil rights to, you know, just the black church. I'm not that, that one-sided or one-dimensional, but we do know that it was housed, a lot of it was funded by the church. Right. That being said, people in other nations like South Africa, um, some Latin American countries looked at what we were doing and used the black church as a model for their own national independence. Right. Okay? right. So that, that goes way beyond people from down the street. Or the person who used to babysit you, that's someone on the other side of the world. And so if we have that type of influence, we got to be responsible. You know, one thing I, I did want to um, kind of point out, because it's very interesting that you as a woman have written about um, leadership in the black church and women being leaders in the black church is still relatively new. So, I mean, was that something that um, kind of crossed your mind as you were doing the research for this book? Okay, so let's go on. We'll use another trending term, full transparency. Um, my background, because I like to be very honest with people, whether it's in my professional life, my personal life, mm -hmm. my, my authorship life, so to speak. Again, I'm a member of the Black Church. I grew up going to a Baptist church. My dad was just installed. Well, actually, I was Catholic for a few years, but I went to a Black Catholic school. Um, my dad was just installed as a pastor two months ago um, in Fort Heights, Illinois. Yeah, to him. <laughs> um, but it did not. Well, I shouldn't say it never crossed my mind. I do remember when I was younger, women ministers in the pulpit wasn't really a thing. And I remember as it began to change slowly, hearing murmurs of, but I was still a child then, right? Mm -hmm. So the adults weren't really going to tell you, we don't agree with it, it's not right, or what have you. That's actually one of the things that kind of just hurt my heart, so to speak, mm -hmm. as I was doing the research for the book, because it shows not just in the research. Um, I have a book by Cheryl Jokes, who's a Black sociologist, um, also a Black Baptist minister. Uh, she teaches at a school up in the Northeast. Her book is called If It Weren't for the Women. And it talks about the women's suffrage movement. It talks about the civil rights movement. It talks about the movement for equal pay and equality with Blacks. It talks about the church. And But the undercurrent is, if it weren't for women, none of those movements, none of those institutions would exist because women were the backbone. Women were doing the work. Um, even when you look at, so we'll go back to picking on the civil rights movement. Um, people who, and, and again, we can step outside of the black church now, right? You had MLK, huge, huge figure of the civil rights movement. He was off somewhere a lot of times. Who was at home with his kids? Coretta was. Mm -hmm. You had Malcolm X. He was not of the black, he was, you know, Islamic of the Muslim faith, but he would be out a lot of times. 
who was at home with his kid, Dr. Betty Shabazz. Medgar Evers, when he was shot and killed, his wife, Merle Edwards, was not with him. So even if you look at that, a lot of times it was the women who were still at home keeping the house and raising the children, sometimes dealing with bomb threats by themselves. And no, the women still are a, a vast minority yeah. um, comparatively. If you, in chapter 12, I will tell you there is a section on gender bias. I wanted to do an entire chapter on it, but my doctoral chair said, no, ma'am, you don't have any more chapters <laughs> left to write. You're already over. She said, if you don't fit it in somewhere, you will not be yeah, saved. You have five chapters. Stick to those five chapters. Save it to for <laughs> another book, right? And so, but I couldn't leave that part out. And I couldn't leave that part out because what you said, if you look just the statistics, According to Pew Research Center and some other tabulating agencies, anywhere between, I'll, I'll do a broad range, 70 to 80 percent. There's some studies that say 80 percent, some say 75, some say 70. But most of them agree that somewhere between 70 and 80 percent of the black church's composition is women. But then when you look at people who are in those executive leadership roles, right, right. it's reversed. Um, I had a chance to interview the presiding bishop of the Church of God in Christ, Bishop J. Drew Sheard, which is the largest black denomination because of the splinter and fracture of the uh, National Baptist um, Convention. But I asked that question because in the Kojic denomination, women are not ordained ministers. They are not pastors. Um, and, and so just by reading Reading what was out there, but again, the, my, my participants and my interviewees, they mentioned that. And I think one of the very first persons I interviewed, uh, Dr. Wayne Croft, who was a member of Kappa Alpha Psi and is a professor uh, and a pastor at a church in Northeast Pennsylvania, he was the one that originally put it on my radar. He's like, when you look at the leadership in the Black church, it is still by far more men than women. And so I posed the question in the book, did the, the gender bias, so to speak, did the church take it from white America or did white America take it from the church? That's the subject Ooh. for the manuscript because I would have to do a whole lot more digging. Well, I, I need you to write that book because now you have me pondering. But, but you have to think about it, right? Yes. You have to think about where did the gender oppression, and that's how I, I term it, did the gender oppression come from an outside source or an inside source? And if we look at most external sources, just in the Black culture in America, right, again, you have to look at chronology. And chronologically, the church came first. So are we encouraging? Are we, we're definitely upholding it. But are, are we setting up systems that are going to perpetuate the oppression? Um, and then how do you, and another question was, how do you dismantle systems right. that are built that way? Um, you know, the, they say it's hard being a black man and I, it, is, it is, it's just hard being black period in America. But then when you look at things like this within our culture where it's hard enough being a black woman in America, but then when we look at structures that are internal to our own culture, there's that additional gender suppression. I just kind of was like, um, okay. I was like, I, I kind of feel some kind of way about that. Right. Excuse me, my phone decided to ring in the middle of our conversation. Life, look, life is going to life. <laughs> Well, I am back now. I just paused the phone. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, it's just it, like I said, it made me feel some kind of way. Like when I when I put together the numbers and looked at what the other people who were experts were saying and looked at the, I was like, well, we do have gender oppression. That's not cool. Hmm. Like, yeah, that's not cool. And there's, there are churches, I'll go so far as to say this, and you'll understand this being a member of a sorority. There are churches that have it in their constitution and bylaws that a woman cannot be pastor. There are churches right now that I know that are going yeah. through the processes of changing the bylaws because a woman can't even hold that seat currently. 
Mm-hmm. There are other denominations that it's in their doctrine a woman cannot. Well, and it's, it's not even just doctrine. I mean, I remember growing up thinking that um, it was a sin for a woman to lead the church because that was what I, that was always, what was always ingrained in me. I, you know, it's you know, and thank God when you get older and you know better, you do better because. Um, I had to really look in the Bible and see that there were women who were leaders. And oh, so, <laughs> yeah, I mean, if you, I mean, if you, if you look through the Bible, there's so many examples of women who had to lead Then Sometimes they didn't want to lead. They just had to take the lead. Oh, uh, Esther. Exactly. You, and I mean, if you just want to be overly simplistic yet, or better yet, I'll, I'll go really simplistic. Um, Jesus was not born by virtue of a man, had to come from a woman. So, you know, Mary could be your ultimate example. But then you look at Esther, you even look at Rahab. And a lot of people don't know Rahab's lineage. They just know that Rahab was a whore. Yeah. Well, I listen to T. You better, you better read that lineage because if it weren't for her. Hope, if it weren't for <laughs> Rahab. You never would have gotten to Jesse, who never would have gotten to David, yep. who never would have gotten to Jesus. Yep. Um, and and T.D. Jakes gives a really, really deep example. And of all his sermons that I, I've heard him preach, there's a couple that stick with me. And one I actually reference in the book because it's a direct re- reference to leadership. He says, when I'm here at the Potter's house, I can talk to you all about greens, ham hocks, uh, sweet potatoes. He said, because that's what we eat here. He said, but when I go to West Africa, I'm talking to them about yams and jollof rice because that's the point there. And what he is talking about in a religious context, so to speak, is what's known as cultural agility. And in order to be an effective leader, you have to have cultural agility, cultural competencies. You need to be able to flow between various um, cultures and and demographics seamlessly. But then the other one that he preaches, you know, when you talk about women in Rahab, he analogizes and he it was so deep. And I just looked at the TV like, are you serious? Um, he goes through, you know, Rahab letting down the cord, but then he analogizes the cord that Rahab used yes. as the umbilical cord on biblical cord to Christ. Mm. Because yeah. he was of the lineage of Rahab. And I do believe the point of that sermon was that it didn't matter what you look like so much on the outside or how the world saw you because the world saw her as a hooker. She was a whore. That's what, you know, that's what it says. And we, but see, then again, we see that now. We, we see somebody as what we think they are and we never want to look past those layers to see who they really are. Exactly. And, and so and even looking at that example ties back into leadership. You can't, and something you just said is so important. When you talk about confirmation bias, a lot of times people, when they have an interaction with someone, when they read something, they're just looking to confirm a bias that they've already formulated in their mind about the person. In order to be an astute leader, an effective leader, an exemplary leader, you have to come to the table with open eyes, fresh eyes, fresh ears, Mm. not coming to confirm what you thought you already knew. Absolutely. Dr. Randolph, I wish I could talk to you longer. This conversation was getting good, (laughs) but unfortunately we reached the end of the um, segment, but I did want to share that, um, you know, information on how people can purchase the book. I've gone ahead and put the flyer on the screen right now. Um, And if you can repeat, where can people find this book? It is available at Amazon, um, Target, online, Barnes and Noble, other retail outlets. It's even simpler ways of looking for it. If you just take the title of the book, The Black American Church Leadership Dispensation and Challenges and put it in Google, it will tell you everywhere you can buy it. If you go to Amazon and type in my name, it will bring it up. Um, So either my name or the book will both get you to the proper destination. Awesome. And do you have any um, appearances or anything or anything that people can come support? 
We currently know appearances, appearances, ooh, that's a good word, but look for some things coming up in the next couple of months. I'm contributing to another book project, um, so that will be announced shortly, working on rebranding my consulting firm. So if you're on LinkedIn, Dr. Condicia Randolph, comma, M-A-M-P-A, um, we're going to start next Monday, Monday Morning Leaderships and Tuesday Tidbits for Leaders. Okay, wonderful. Is there a website that people can visit? I did put your book website up right here. Yes, um, ma'am. Um, is that the best place where they can find information about the book as well as your consulting services? That is the best place right now as far as the consulting services. That website is under construction um, coming soon. So the best way to contact me is actually it's real simple. If you go to the Facebook author book page, my actual home, my actual cell phone number is on there. So that <laughs> will come directly to me. The email addresses that are associated will come directly to me. Um, again, if you just type in my name in Google, it'll take you to any and every social platform because I'm the only one with my name. Um, everything's downloaded to my phone. So I'm fairly easy to find. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for joining me tonight. I really enjoyed our conversation. No um, problem. This is a really thought-provoking book. Um, and I want you to um, um, listen in. You don't have to stay on, but if I want you to listen in to the next interview, because this we've got to get this book into libraries. And my, our next guest is going to talk about how we can get um, independent authors into libraries. Perfect. Well, I will stay tuned. And thank you again, Soror. And thank you so much. It was really good talking with you. Thanks so much. And you enjoy your evening. And God bless everything that you do. Thank you. All right. Have a great one. So that was Dr. Candicia Randolph. And um, if you missed her book, I'm going to go ahead and put the um, flyer back up again. Um, the Black American Church, Leadership Dispens Dispensation and Challenges. Um, very, very thought provoking book. And um, we ask you all to make sure that you please support this book. And now something else I'd like you to support in case you hadn't heard. I have a five day fiction writing masterclass coming starting on Wednesday. And no, it is not too late to sign up. So if you need some more information, just listen. Hey, what's up, y'all? It's your girl, Dr. Rondi M. Lawson, and I am here by taking away every excuse you have for not starting that book. You keep telling your friends you're going to write one day. <laughs> Don't have time. I'm about to give you the strategy. Don't know where to start? I've got the inspiration. Don't want to pay for a class? Child, it's free. Starting August 23rd, I'll be hosting a five-day masterclass, especially for fiction writers. As a 23-time published author, you know fiction is my jam, and I want to give you the tools to finally make your dream story a reality. Just click the link in my bio. I'm waiting. Let's get started. Hey, what's up, y'all? All right, y'all. That's the free five-day fiction writing masterclass starting on Wednesday. We are going to give you the tools that you need to finally get that book started. So if you like more information on that, all you have to do is DM me. You can DM me or you can email me and the information, or you can even call me. The information is right here on this flyer. So um, if you need more information, just let me know and I'll send it to you. And I'll also be putting a link to the uh, masterclass in the chat. So make sure you click the link so you can sign up. Like I said, it's absolutely free and I want to see you there. So now let's go ahead and talk to our next guest. And here he is, Mr. Richard Ashby Jr. Hello, can you hear me? Well, you got to get off mute. There Hello. he is. <laughs> hey, How listen, are you? You, I'm doing fantastic. How are you? I am wonderful. I'm so glad to finally have you on my show. I know. I, you know, it's so it's wonderful to be here. <laughs> Saturday, I was having a nervous breakdown. I was like, um, I, I saw something of yours came across one of my social <laughs> media. And I was like, oh Lord, she's gonna kill me. I haven't rescheduled for her. And then this last night, I, I received the emails. I was like, oh, I, I'm here. But you, you did not have to stop, Doctor. I don't see that was a good conversation. Huh? Oh my God, that was good. That was good. I was like, I was gonna hold up a sign saying, you know, overtime. Go to go overtime. <laughs> go to go to go to go to, or fifth, go to the fifth quarter. But um, I want I want her book. I want I want to put that book in my catalog. 
I figured you would enjoy that book. So that's why I asked her to stick around and just listen in because we've got to get that book into libraries. We have to get that book into the libraries. Um, I, I'm already talking about on Instagram, on LinkedIn, because I, I went to LinkedIn. <laughs> I, just, I was talking to him. That's what I was doing when you this come is in. What we do. We bring people together. Yes. In the Horizons Author Lounge. So I, I definitely want to. I want her book. I want to get it cataloged. I want to um, just do all I can for her and her book, and because it's something that needs to be done. She said, "I'm still." <laughs> yes, it's something that needs to, that word. What she has is something that we need need to do. And we'll talk about it later. But I'm just so glad to be here. This is only my seventh Zoom call today. So. Oh my, you've been busy. Ah, yeah. Pushing for these independent authors. I love it. I love it. Well, you know, I've got to thank you personally. And I know I've said it before. And I've also said it on Black Authors Matter TV. I really love what you are doing for the independent author. Because it's not just one thing to sell books. You really want to establish your brand. You want to get your book into the hands of people who are really going to appreciate it and really read it. And the libraries still have an audience. I know some people say, well, I don't know if I want to put my book in the library. That means I'm not selling it. And now I'm just giving the book away for free and I can't make money off of that. But there's so much more to having your book in the library. So can we talk about that? So you want... You want your book in the library. Yes. <laughs> and you're not giving it away free because once you get your book into the library and you market that book properly, libraries around the country is going to be by one, two, three, four, five copies. Um, you you have more libraries buying books than you have individuals. That's, mm. You know, you can write a book and your best friends aren't going to buy it. Girl, I'm, I'm listen, I'm going to buy it, but my cash app is down. <laughs> You know, I, I was going to buy it, but, you know, Pookie needs sneakers because he's going to he's going to the swim camp this summer. He needs sneakers for the swim camp. Give me some good reasons why you're not buying the book. I keep telling people stop depending on I mean, people. I, I stopped doing it. You know, I used to feel a kind of way if a family member didn't buy my book, but I didn't get into this business just so my family can buy my book. I mean, the one of the biggest things that meant a lot to me is when I held an event and I had no family members there. And what it meant to me is that the word is getting out about what I'm doing. Yes. So, yeah, it means a lot when the family supports, but I don't just want my family to support because that's not how I'm going to make money. That's not how I'm going to expand my brand. Nope. Nope. You're right. <laughs> so let me tell you about who I am and what I do. Okay. Yes. So first of all, I have to, I'm, I'm probably the most blessed black man in America. <laughs> <laughs> I am the past president of the New York Black Librarians Caucus. I'm the past president of the National Black Librarians Caucus, the Black Caucus of the American Library Association. I am the current president and co-founder of the Pennsylvania Black Librarians Caucus. I'm on the Pennsylvania um, EDI, Pennsylvania Library Association EDI Committee. I'm a founding member. I'm a founding member of the Delaware County EDI Committee. I'm on the American Library Association Square Scott King Roundtable. I'm on the American Library Association Diversity Committee. And I'm the director of the Sharon Hill Public Library. I am the 2016 Librarian of the Year for the Black Caucus. I was oh 2014 um, library, uh, school library journal, I mean library journal mover and shaker. And I am just, I am the president and co-founder of Literacy Nation, where our motto is with literacy and justice for all, because America can tell you liberty and justice, but without literacy, you will receive no justice. Mm. And so with Literacy Nation, we, we promote literacy and uh, we do different programs. We have a program which we don't talk about a lot called Pharmacies and Books. We put children's books in pharmacies. And so when the mother or father or grandmother or caretaker come in and get a prescription filled for a child with medication, that child also gets a book. Nice. And so that we have a captive audience. Little Ray Ray can't get up and run around. He's in the bed. He's got to read, you know. So read something interesting to him, something that helps with the representation. And so with Literacy Nation, we've put over 2,000 books into the library. 
of, of black and melanated authors. Uh, for, for, for a black man or woman to get their book into the library is like a black man or woman voting in Mississippi in 1954. It just ain't gonna happen, folks. Mm. And so we, um, we put books into libraries. And one of the things that we found out when putting the books into the library, and one of the reasons we do it is because of representation. So when you take your book to a library and you say, can I put my book, can you put my book into a library? You are at the mercy of that person, which is usually a white person in the library. And um, so they give you a piece of paper and they say, well, this is why we can't put the book into the library. And that piece of paper they give you is called the Collection and Development Management Policy. And that book, and that policy basically says, if you're an independent author, your book can't be put in the library. If your book is not hardcover, the book cannot be put in the library. If your book is not Kirkus reviewed, Publisher Weekly reviewed, or Horn Book reviewed, it probably will not be put in the library. And at Literacy Nation, we help you get your book library ready. We help you get the Kirkus reviewed or Horn Book reviewed. This is the um, Publisher okay. Weekly review, and Kirkus we can't. Review is um, sometimes that can be a little intimidating because um, people don't realize that's a paid review. And it may cost a little bit. And sometimes so, people yes. don't want to make that um, investment. There you go. And so what I say, did I say then you, then you don't want to be an author? Mm. If, you, if you're not going to invest in yourself, then you don't want to be an author. Um, you want to look good, right? You want to look good. Yeah, I want to look good. So you went and got your hair did, you got your nails did, you got all that did so you can look good. But your, the book is your child. And now you're going to neglect your child. <laughs> you're a deadbeat parent when it comes to your book. It's going to cost you three hundred and fifty dollars, four hundred dollars to get your book Kirkus review, and you might not get a great review because Kirkus is known for not giving independent authors great reviews. But I was wondering about that. I'm like, so you, and I think that's something else that's scary. You paying for something and you don't know what you're going to get back. You don't know what you're going to get. Back. But now here's the kicker. Here's where here's where we come in. You might not get a great review, but that's okay. It says it has to be Kirkus reviewed. It doesn't say it has to be an excellent Kirkus reviewed. <laughs> okay. So Kirkus may say, well, you know what? The book is okay, blah, 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 blah. Okay, fine. But now it's eligible to go into the library because everybody's not going to see the same thing about a book. Right. And America is looking for diverse books. So even though it might not get a great review, they still will probably put that book into the library because it's met, met all the check marks and it's a black book, it's a diverse book. Mm. But we said, okay, why depend on the li Why depend on Karen over here to put the book in the library? I'm a library director. I'm the president of the Black Libraries of Pennsylvania. We put the books in the library ourselves. So now you got now not not only is your book Kirkus reviewed, not only is the hardcover, not only is the catalog into the World Cat, it's also in the library. So now when you walk into the library, you don't walk in mealy mouth, book in hand. Hi, I'm a I'm an independent author. Can you put my book in the library? No, you go in there with your chest out, head done, everything. Mm. Listen, I'm an author. This is my book. It's cataloged. It's Kirkus reviewed. It's in the Sharon Hill Public Library. It's in the Brooklyn Public Library. It's in the Stora Public Library. It is in the Yaden Public Library. I would like to put it in your library. I know. And in addition to that, I'm going to give you the book and I'll do a story hour or book talk. Boom. Now what? Wow. Now what? And we catalog the books ourselves. We have our own catalogers. They're called Indie Cats. Um, let me see what that says. Mm -hmm. With our library, you can donate a book to the library, then ask your readers to request your book. And if your book is only in your state, they will not order books that are not in other states. I learned this from setting up book signings. And then she said, wow, to what Dr. Candice is saying. Awesome. So <laughs> there's a way to get around that, too. Oh. There's, there's a way to get around everything. So what did she say now? She said you, they will only purchase books that are in your state, but not in other states? Right. If your book is only in your state, they will not order books that are not in other states. That is the weirdest collection of development policy I, I've ever heard. And so here's how you get around that. And we, we've, we've um, that's, I shouldn't say weird. That's the 
that is the um it's different. That is the most I don't want to say, but that's not that's not good. That's like having given somebody a reading test to, to vote. So here's how you here's here's how you get around that. Very little people know about it's called the ILL. That's called the in, interlibrary loan. I L L. So I I'm in use that a lot. I'm 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 in Philadelphia. You're in where are you at Chicago? I'm in the DMV. I'm in the DC area. Right, I just left you in DC. You're in you in DC. <laughs> Let's see Maryland. Your book is in Maryland. I've cataloged your book and it's in, it's in Philly. Marketing 101. You go to you go to your library in Maryland. No. You go to you go to the library in Maryland and you say, I want the cat in the hat. That's just it. I want the cat in the hat. But that library is not gonna have it because it's in DC. I mean, because it's in Philadelphia. Then you go to, you call another, you call your cousins, then you call your cousin's friends. Call the library and ask for that book. That book, when, once that book hit a certain number in that library, five people are waiting for this book. They're going to buy the book because it's on demand. If nobody, if that book is in D.C. and ain't nobody asking for it, then why buy it? Mm -hmm. so you have to get that book on the interlibrary loan list. So you have people ask for the book. And the same thing within your state. So you, you, I tell you your book is, you can, you can go to your local library and say, um, or any library and say, I want that book. And they won't have it. They can get that book. Books are shipped free, no cost to you, from one state to the next. So once they ship that book from Philly to Maryland, and somebody else come and say they want the book, and if somebody else comes they want the book, now they're going to look at that book and they're going to purchase it because the book is on demand. Right. But if nobody's asking for the book, then why should we add the book to our collection? That's money that we're spending. So there's ways around this, um, all these uh, policies and procedures. Um, and I've been, and I'm, and I'm, I'm not telling you what I think, I'm telling you what I know. I've been doing this since 1990. I've been a librarian. Um, I've been in the library field. Man, I mean, how do you like what made you decide to join the library system? Well, a couple of things. <laughs> <laughs> when I was 15 years old, I was a very poor reader, and my mother said, and um, we had this young man, I had a friend of mine. I grew up in New York City, Queens, and um, I'll be 69 on my birthday, so I grew back up in back in the day. And back in the days, um, so in the civil rights era, we had a lot of strikes and marches and sit-ins and riots and protests. And um, during that time, when you didn't go to the marches and protests and sit-ins or boycotts, when you went to school, they would put you in the basement of the school and give you an instrument. And so um, I played trumpet. And growing up in New York City, everything was the Apollo Theater and everything was the, the, the music, the, the theaters. And one Friday evening when I was about 16 years old, 15, 16 years old, we were, getting, we were getting ready to go to Apollo. And my friend Chucky came to me and he says, hey, guys, there's a program at the library. Do you want to go? <laughs> Why you make his voice sound like that? <laughs> I'm like, what? There's a program at the library. Do you want to go? And I'm like, to the library? Who goes to the library on Friday night in New York City? We're going to the, we're going to the, we're going to the Apollo. And I teased this guy until he was like in tears. And we were sitting in my in my yard. My mother came out. She said, she's like, you know, stop teasing Chucky and get inside, you know. And she said, why, why are you teasing Chucky? I said, because Chucky's going to the library. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me and she said, you need to stop because one day you'll be a librarian. And I said, mm. She says, I'm looking at you, and God's telling me that you're going to be a librarian one day. And I thought that was the craziest thing I could hear. Here I am in the 10th grade reading on 7th grade level. I'm, trying, I'm, not, I'm not being no librarian. She just spoke life, she just spoke life into you. It spoke her into existence. And then um, I went on to college, and, I, I, and when I got to like the 12th grade, 11th grade, 12th grade, I found a love for reading. And I went to college, and um, I worked in a library in college, and I still wasn't into libraries. And 
or you know, um, I used to write books. My my fiance back then we used to write books. I would do, and we would go to different libraries and do story hours. And then um, got married. It was was in the middle of a, a nasty divorce, and mm. my wife would not let me see my son. And um, I was just like just at my wit's end. And I had just left the state trooper. I was the state trooper, and I left the state troopers. I wasn't happy with that. And I wasn't happy with my marriage, and my wife would let me see my son, and um, had my college degree. And this man comes to me, I barely knew him, and he says, um, they're looking, they, they built a new library in the community, and it, and it opens up on Monday, but they need a um, security guard for the, for the library. And I was so mad with him. I was like, a security guard for the library? I have a degree. <laughs> <laughs> A Russian cop pick in mind. I, I, my goal, I left the state troopers. When I left the state troopers, because I didn't want to be a state trooper, I wanted to be a lawyer. I wanted to be a lawyer, a congressman, and a Baptist minister. That's what I wanted to be. Mm. <laughs> and, you know, I met Dr. King when I was nine years old, and that's what I wanted to be. I wanted to be a Baptist minister. And so when this guy's like, well, do you want to be a, um, work in the library as a security guard? I was... Richard, ask me a security guard in the library. You lost your mind. So I had called my mom. I was so mad. I was like, Mom, can you believe this? This idiot asked me if I want to be a security guard at the library. And she's like, Well, what's wrong with that? I was like, I have a degree. <laughs> she goes, Who cares? She goes, Who cares? She said, You're not thinking with, with your head and you're not thinking. You're not thinking. This, this woman will not let you see your son. But if you worked at the library, and then he, you can see your son after school because he goes to the. He's gonna, she's gonna let him come to the library and do a homework. You can have a direct impact on his life if you be, if you work as a security guard at the library. And I was like, you think so? She's like, yeah. And so I talked to her. And I was like, well, I'm gonna be a security guard at the library. Would you let um, you know our son come to the library after school? She's like, of course. Mm. And so I started working in the library, and um. I started as security guard and I did a good job and the director promoted me the next year. He made me the custodian. Oh boy, was a custodian with a degree. You know, I was the smartest thing walking. <laughs> he made me the custodian. Then he put me behind the um, children's section. I was a children's librarian. I wasn't really a librarian. I was a bootleg children librarian. I was a bootleg reference librarian. He put me in the teen section. He put me in acquisitions. He put me behind the front desk. For like 15 years, he just put me all over this library. And you fell in love with books. I just, I just fell in love with it, and he. Um, but still, I'm not a librarian yet. I'm just a glorified security guard that's working in a library with a degree. And he retired, and it was all white librarians. And I never forget it was, it was in February 2005. He retired, and there was a fight in the library, and um, the white librarians were clutching their pearls. And this one little girl, Shamika, was kicking Damien's behind all over the library, two little black kids. <laughs> she was wiping off the floor with little Damien because he refused to hit her back. And she was molly whopping him. Mm. <laughs> and I broke up the fight and I said, what's what's going on? Why are you all fighting? And she said, he calls me a name. He called me a name. And I said, what do you call her? He wouldn't say, he called me a name. I wouldn't call her. And he looked at me and he said, well, the book you gave us to do our report Right there it says, Dr. King walked with the Negroes. So I called her a Negro because she looked like the people in the book. Mm. And then the, the, the librarians were like, uh, uh. <laughs> <laughs> She's like, yes, he called me a Negro. And I was like, oh, girl, stop crying. I was a Negro. And everybody's like, uh. <laughs> and, and she goes, you were a Negro? I said, yeah. She goes, where were you a Negro? I said, well, back in 1954 when I was born, the, my, my birth certificate says Negro. I said, then somewhere around 1969, 70, I became black, and then I became African-American. Now I don't know what I am. I'm all kind of, you know? <laughs> and the librarian said, you can't tell them that. And I was like, why? Were you ever a Negro too? Mm. And they're like, get off the floor. And they put, me out the, they put me off the floor, and I went back and I told one of the trustees in the back office what happened. And she said, get out of my office. And I was like, what? Why are you talking to me like that? She's like, you've been in this library for 15 years, and all you did was complain about the white people. Mm. Mr. Jerry retired. He was a black director. I'm getting ready to retire, and we're going to leave you here in this black community with all white librarians. 
and you have done nothing. And um, I went back the next morning. So Antioch Baptist Church came and gave me a check for hundred dollars. Said it was seed money. The, the um, Community Development Corporation came and gave me another check for hundred dollars. They said it was the seed money for me to go back to school and become a librarian. And um, I went back to school, and I told the school when I got there. They said, "What do you want to be?" I said, "I want to be a director." They said, "Nobody goes to school to be a library director. You have to become a librarian and last for eight years, at least eight years, and then apply for a director." And I told them the only thing I know: you don't know the God I serve. Mm. I come to be a director. They let me go to school. I, I went to like a 3.9 um, CUM. I graduated. And a week later, I was a director of a library. And I've been a director of a library ever since. I've never been just the librarian. I've always been a director of a library. Wow. So I'm thinking that we don't see a lot of Black men as um, not even just li library directors, but librarians in general. There's 165,000 librarians in this country. Mm. Five, <laughs> 500 of those, 500 of that 165,000 are, are black men. 500? Of the 165,000 are black men. Wow. 30 of those 500 are, are library directors. Wow. There are 30 black male public library directors in this country, and I happen to be one. That's Which great. means, not that I'm smart, not that I'm good looking, but I'm blessed. And Absolutely. so because I'm blessed, um, I do what I do for independent authors. I do what I do for, for the community. Um, I guess about two years ago, Howard University called and asked me would I come down to Howard University and be the director at one of their library. And I had to turn them down. Big money, big office, big prestige. But I couldn't do the work that God sent me to do. I'm in a small community library where, where kids walk in and they see a black man in the building. They see a black man um, buying books for them. They see a black man uh, running the building in programs, walking the streets, and they they see they don't see a whole lot of bling in my mouth, and they don't see me walking with my pants down. They don't see me talking slang, but they see me enjoying life. But I ride, a, I drive a. I drive a Mustang that's convertible that's bad. And the kids are like, whoa! <laughs> and I pump my music up loud. And they're like, what? Are, are you, you're the loudest librarian in the world. But I'm the, happiest, <laughs> I'm the happiest librarian in the world. Even the police chief was like, Mr. Rashby, can you like tone the music down? No, I can't. <laughs> I'm yeah. happy, you know? And so I love, I love, I love what I'm doing. Um, I wouldn't trade. I wouldn't trade it in for the world. For the world, I'll be sixty nine on my birthday. I'm a. I'm a um, cancer survivor. Um, I was, mm. was homeless for a year. Uh, I went blind. For, I guess for two years. Um, I did something really. I, I do it again. I don't care. Um, they were selling drugs in my library, and they were. Um, just selling drugs at my library. They were like, you know, we're gonna sell drugs. You can't do anything about it. So I flushed them. Mm. I flushed their drugs. I flushed the cocaine. Oh, there was some high fish wow. in that <laughs> they, they came in, they was like, yo, dude, what the stuff that was in the bathroom under the sinks? Well, that, I flushed it. And um, a couple of weeks later, I was walking home. They hit me in the head with a pipe. I lost my eyesight. Mm. But uh, I'd do it again because I'm, you know, Listen, you're not selling. You're not selling drugs in my library. You're not selling drugs in my community. Um, I had a. I had about. We need, to go, ahead and, we need to go ahead and stop playing around and make a movie about you. <laughs> <laughs> and so, people like so when my mom and dad was like, they was like, we need to make a movie. I was like, you are not putting stuff I did on the screen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, uh, real quick uh, when I was in my twenties, I used to want to be a comedian. I just want to be a comedian, and um. Eddie Murphy and Charlie Burnett and all the comedians out of New York, they um, was on Long Island. And they would um, come to this club called the Native New Yorker and we, we, we would do our joke, we do stand up. And one night, um, one Saturday, <laughs> my sister said to my mother, um, oh, Richie's funny. She says, I know he's funny. My mother used to give me little sheets of paper with scriptures on them and with jokes and with with poems and I would have to learn all these things. And she said that my mother said that I would she said you can't count. 
and I could see you um, being in front of people, being a speaker, being an auditor. So she taught me how to speak and she taught me how to command the, command the audience. And so I took this to the stage to be a comedian. <laughs> and so um, Eddie Murphy's filthy, filthy mouth. Oh, yeah. Filthy. Grew up, grew up in this, grew up in the same area he grew up with. You know, he hung with my family, my cousin. Anyway, so he, this is before he was Eddie Murphy, and so he was on stage one night, and he was just giving it to him, filthy. And I'm a church boy. I get up on stage and I'm filthy, and I, um, so my sister, little snitch, she goes <laughs> home. She says, um, it's, 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 um, it's Saturday morning. You know, we we in we in the house dusting and cleaning. This. Chick says, oh, mommy, Richie's funny. She goes, what do you mean Richie's funny? She goes, he was at the club last night telling jokes. Ooh. Well, like, at the club last night telling jokes, you were supposed to be at Maurice's house. And I was like, dang. Let it. I said, well, what kind of jokes are she telling? So my sister started repeating the jokes with curses in them. <laughs> mm. my, mother, my mother said, oh, yeah, you're pretty funny, huh? Well, you can't live here being on stage cursing. So you need to go upstairs to pack your stuff and get out of my house. Oh, wow. And so I came back downstairs. I'm like, listen, I don't want to be a comedian. <laughs> Can I stay? <laughs> so that was my short. That was my short-lived comedic life. But now I do Christian comedy. Now okay, I do. Okay, Christian comedy. We now, I do, now I do Christian comedy. Thanks to my sister, the little snitch. <laughs> well, um, unfortunately, we have reached the end of the segment. But before we log off, I mean, you know, the good thing about it when it's your own show, you can go over a little bit. But um, two things. One, um, you really identified a hole in your industry. And I'm sure that there are a number of black men out there who are probably looking for their way. And there are so many authors out there, black male authors that this could be an opportunity for them. So if maybe you can take a minute to talk about how do you get into being an, a librarian? And then after after you do that, if you can take another minute to how, how um, we as authors, independent authors, if you can repeat how we can get into that process of getting our books into libraries. Okay, so brothers, you need, you, all you need is a, a bachelor's degree you need a bachelor's degree. You get to a library and you um, work work in a library as a library assistant. You look at just your local library associations. They have scholarships for you to go to school. Um, Black Caucus of American Library Association have scholarships for you to go to school nationwide. American Library Association has a scholarship called the Spectrum Scholarship nationwide. If you live in the Philadelphia area, you, and you can make it to my library, you come down and I will teach you how to be a librarian. So when you go apply for the job, when you at the library, you go quit, equipped. So I will teach you how to make library cards, how to do interlibrary loans, Ooh. how to shelve a book, how to catalog a book for a, a copy catalog. And I teach you all of these things. So when you walk into a library and say, I'm looking for a job, and you say, well, we're not hiring, say, oh, that's too bad because I know how to do library cards, I could do interlibrary loans. I give you those tangible skills. Beautiful. If you're an author and you want to get your book into the library, I say, come join Literacy Nation. We're not just an organization, we're a movement. We're a part of the American Library Association. It's only $49 to join our organization. I'll tell you what we do. We catalog your book. And for example, on September 10th, we're going to, September 23rd, we're going to the Harlem Book Fair. We're paying the way for 20 authors to vend at the Harlem Book Fair. We're paying your way and your table and your chair. And when you get to the Harlem Book Fair, all the books you sell, all the t-shirts you sell, you keep 100% of your money. Mm. I'm a librarian, not a pimp. <laughs> <laughs> so when I put you out there on the street to sell your books, you keep all the money for your books. And, and that's what we do. We took, we're going to, we're going to take, we're taking authors with us to New Orleans next July and San Diego next June and back to Harlem again and all in between that. And um, we also paid for 60 authors to become members of the Black Caucus of the American Library Association paid their fees, paid their fees to get into the conference, took, like, took authors down to San Diego with us this year. They sold out. 
took them to Chicago this year. They sold out. So $49, but we're giving you way back. We're giving your money back for $49. So if you want to get into the library, move your books into the library, join us. Um, my number is on my website. My number is 646 721 1358. You can call me. We can have a conversation. And a lot of times when you um, people charge you for consultation, I don't charge you for consultation because I'm, I'm talking more than you talking during the consultation. So I probably <laughs> cash out you, you $25 for listening to me. And so well, now, real quick now, is is it $49 per book or $49 period? It's $49 period. And we catalog your first book. And after that, it's $25 a book. But we catalog your first book. So every year you get one book catalogs. Well, Mr. Ashby, Mr. Richard, thank you so much. Um, I've already told you I believe in your mission and I'm going to support your mission in any way possible that I can do it because I love what you're doing. Um, we need to get more of our independent authors in the library. But now authors, you have to do the work. You can't just throw a book together right. and think that um, Mr. Richard is going to put his name on it and say... Um, Get it in. Get it in the um, library. Yeah. We have beta That's readers. Working. We have we have a, we have a system where we vet your books. We make sure your book is right. We tell you lovingly if something's wrong with your book. Don't let your cousin Joni be your editor. Joni graduated third in the class of two. She's not an editor. <laughs> That's wrong. I'm wrong for that. <laughs> Joni is not an editor. Okay. You two books professionally edited, and we have professional editors that can help you out. We have publishers that can help you out. Awesome, awesome, awesome. Well, once again, thank you, Mr. Richard. I appreciate you being a part of the show. Anytime you want to come back, all you have to do is just say the word. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And I, like I said, I, I'm, I love you. You have such a great spirit, and um, I'll be back again. Yay. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Okay. Thanks so much. All right, everybody. That is another episode of the Horizons Author Lounge. Thank you so much for your support. Thank you for helping me to make this show grow and to continue to be a service to um, authors and other literary professionals. That's what this show is all about. And that's why this show is free, because we want to continue to support as many authors as we can. Now, don't forget on... Um, Wednesday, we start the free five-day fiction writing masterclass, and I would love for you to be a part of that masterclass. If you uh, need the information on it, all you have to do is go to um, www. I have lost my dog on link. <laughs> I lost my link, um, but go to go to just call me. Just call me. <laughs> I lost my link. <laughs> okay, now I have it. I have it. Here it is right here. <laughs> Go to www.mtw image solutions front slash um, masterclass. And I'm going to put it in the comments so you can see the link. Boom. Because I want you guys there. This is great, great information that you're going to be getting. Um, you're going to get all of the tools that you need to write your very first book. And I want you to be a part of that. I want, I want you to be able to set, finally stop saying, I want to write a book one day and actually get that book written. So just go to www.mtwimagesolutions.com um, slash masterclass to get more information about this free masterclass, which will start on this coming Wednesday. So don't forget. Also, if you are an author already and you need um, exposure for your book, then I am offering a great, great deal because um, I am the official sponsor for Beautiful Lawson, who will be going to the National All-American Miss Pageant in November. And so to help her to raise money for her pageant, I am offering some great exposure let me go ahead and move the comment out the way so you can see it. I am offering some great exposure for some slashed prices. And this is going to, depending on the level that you get, 
um, it will get you a, a business size card ad in the National um, American Miss Yearbook. Now that book is going to be viewed by at least 3,000 people. So that is a great way to get exposure for your book. Um, you can you can also get a 60 minute feature um, in the Horizons Lounge. And you can get a custom press release with custom social media graphics, all depending on the level that you um, get. So if you'd like more information about these exposure opportunities, all you have to do is contact me. Just um, slide into the DMs, whether you're on LinkedIn, um, Facebook, or if you're on YouTube, um, just slide into the DMs and I will get you some more information on um on these opportunities because I really want you to be a part of it and we want to be able to support this young lady to get to national and to help to um, expand her um, platform, which is giving a voice to those who feel that they have no voice. So that is all we have for tonight, guys. I love you guys. I really appreciate all of your support. Um, I appreciate you helping me to make this show continue to grow and I will see you guys tomorrow night. Um, for Black Authors Matter TV. And so we're going to be interviewing four other authors on Black Authors Matter TV tomorrow. So you can come right back here to the Meet the World Image Solutions Facebook page or to the National Black Book Festival Facebook page. And we'll have more, um, more authors that we'll be talking with on tomorrow night. And then I will see you back here next week for another episode of Horizons Author Lounge. So yes, you get to see me twice a week. <laughs> all right. So that is all we have. You guys enjoy your evening. Have a wonderful week. Have a blessed night and I'll see you tomorrow. Bye, Mr. Richard. Take care. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. <laughs>